So, uh, we continue with uh, whatever we left out yesterday. Just I throw open a thought. We need to take care of a lot of things while paging is enabled. Should I take care of something more, which is architecture specific? While enabling paging. And with that, we will end paging. So, I will give you a clue, pipelining. With respect to pipelining, what will happen? The fetch operand stage, uh, huh? the fetch operand stage will vary depending on whether the is available. Exactly, beautiful. See, now that's that's. So I have, I have fetch instruction stage. I have decode fetch data. Execute. Store result. Let us take this common thing. Where will the pipelining get enabled? When will the paging get enabled? Which stage will the paging get enabled? Huh? Mm -hmm. See, there is a bit in a register, and that bit when it is set to 1, it will go and enable paging. So, when will paging get enabled? Huh? Decoder. Decoder. Store. Store the result because this pattern has to go and sit in the register. <laughs> After that only that bit gets enabled and then. So, by the time you do, several things can happen in this pipeline. And just for the fun of it, if I am going to say that I will plan in such a way that the, the instruction that enables paging. The next instruction is exactly in some other page, somewhere, So, that, but I will map it properly. Are you, are you able to get this? Suppose I could map it pro properly. So, so, just to make fun of uh, the architecture, what I can do is, say this is the instruction that enables paging uh, and there is some other page somewhere. So, the next instruction I want it to execute would be say here, somewhere here. Okay, somewhere here. So, the moment I enable paging, the next instruction to be executed will be fetched from here, should be fetched from here, right. Suppose I write a program like this, I can write a program. Then if your processor is not working correctly according to this, will your processor actually work correctly? No, because by the time you store this result, this instruction, this, 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 four of these instructions could eventually be populating this pipeline. Right? By the time you realize that this instruction is enabling paging, there will be four other instructions that follows could have come and populated this pipeline and they need not necessarily be the instructions that should be executed after it, number one. Number two, suppose they are fetching some data, assume it is a load store instruction, they may be actually the instruction, assuming even that I am identically mapping the page which enables paging. Let these four be the instructions, they have come here, but it need not necessarily be that the data fetched by this instruction and this instruction be exactly the same. They can now because of paging it can fetch from some other location. Are you able to get this? Right? And in the act of it getting fetch, uh, fetching this, it might also lead to a page fault. Right? So, all that I have done in terms of without realizing that the forward instruction is enabling paging, all that I have done in the past have to be completely undone. So, the pipeline has to be flushed while I enable paging, right? Pipeline has to be flushed. It is not just flushing the pipeline, please understand. I should also go and reload my PC, my program counter so that after this is over, the next uh, virtual address is given and then it is, uh, no, I have to subtract it by the number of instructions that I have fetched. Okay. Right? And interestingly, there could be a jump instruction after this, a conditional jump and that would have predicted correctly saying taken and that would have gone and adjusted this PC, some other <laughs> instruction could have also come. So, so many complications can happen by the time this fellow realizes that paging is, uh, 
are able to appreciate, understand what I am trying to say. Okay. So, that is why, so the architecture, so the way of handling this is, the moment I say enable paging or moment I say enable segmentation for example, both, both can have the same issues. I can basically now go and say uh, that flush all the pipeline. So, I will make the architecture go and flush the pipeline. Okay, one minute. Otherwise, what we should do? The compiler should do something to flush the pipeline. That is what you know. If when when we enable paging, then just after that there'll be one jump, next label, and next label call. Just a statement. So this is a unconditional jump. And the moment I put a jump, there are certain architectures which will flush the pipeline. Right? If there are no per prediction, the moment I see a jump, I flush it, flush the pipeline. So, I, while the jump can certainly execute, this is PC relative jumping. So, this jump will execute irrespective of whether you have enabled paging or not. And even if it executes, it will just go to the next level and it will not do anything. And after that, obviously, we can. Uh, paging gets anyway enabled okay so so this is this is something very interesting now the way compiler could have handled this that after enabling paging it could put several no ops but if i am going to have such a compilation then as my architecture changes the compiler also has to become different right, right. so so yes as we go on improving the uh, you know performance of the processor there are a lot of things that come as a baggage to keep consistency with the uh, execution of the program. These are all very, very simple examples um, which basically tells you that as your processor becomes complex, as you go on increasing your pipeline and all these things, what is it that we have to take care? Where will we fail? Right? So, if you, if you look at the entire processor design process, uh, the uh, 75 percent of the time is spent on what we call as verification, whether after doing a change, if all my original programs will work properly or not, right. So, seven, so the entire design, designing a processor, only 25 percent is actual design, the remaining 75 percent is actually verification, okay. And this is very, very crucial verification or validation you can call a lot, lot of things or testing uh, these are all uh, not really synonymous but we can use it at, at least now okay so so i am just giving you case studies uh, relating to uh, what what the os or the compiler needs and what we uh, basically land up complicating the architecture and how careful we need to be and you will agree with me that this is a very, very simple obvious fact, correct? But it did not strike us, right? So, that is why you know you should uh, start, your imagination should be uh, imagination level, I do not know whether you call it analytical ability or this thing, I think it is an imagination ability should be much stronger if you want to be a computer architect. That is why the word architect, architecture has come, right? Architecture needs more imagination. So, that is very, very important. So, you should start imagining, then only you will start, so the, when the world thinks in one way, you should start thinking in some other way, right. And this one very interesting thing, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, what is next? Could be anything. Huh? Could be anything. <laughs> could be anything. Can you tell me, yeah, could be anything, could I can. 20, 21. So, can you give me a reasonable <laughs> argument? <laughs> okay, for 21, like… Uh, 21, I, 21, okay, anybody will say, like right. I will say. Uh, if I take multiples of 19… You have started with Sadako Prince first? Maybe. Ah, yeah. So, you know that, somebody has taught you that. Can you tell me 31 why? Don't. Can you tell me 31? Why 31? Because if I look at, you know, I am constructing all these numbers with only odd digits. 
and the next odd digit after 19 is 31. Correct? I can say 20, that fellow said 20. Just take uh, 19 table, right? 19 ones are 19, 19 twos are 38, like that you come. 19 tens are 190. 19 11 is 209, right? Just do mod 10, you will get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 19, and then you will get 20. So, after this, I could have 20. But you can actually fit functions to say that I could have anything out of this. I could have even minus 5, minus 7, anything. Right? And they are very interesting. So, this is what we term as something out of the box. So, let us go to the next part. So, we had disk where we had the virtual address space. And then we had the RAM where we had the physical address space. Now, this is a bus to which this RAM is connected. This RAM is connected using something called a memory controller. This memory controller is basically an hardware. And then here sits the CPU. Here sits your printer. There will be a printer controller. Here sits your disk and you have a disk, con a disk controller and this is your hard disk. Here is your graphics card and then here sits your monitor, right? Then here there are peripheral interface like PCI Express, you can put anything, your sound card, whatever you want to put. So, this is a basic system, right? Now, when the CPU wants to access RAM, it actually goes through this, there's some, this is a common bus, sometimes this is also called as FSB, front side bus. So, when the CPU wants to access RAM, it goes through this bus, right? It access RAM and, and so whenever it has to go through this bus again, it will wait for, um, so essentially this disk is here, okay. Essentially it again waits for getting that bus, so there is a latency tau plus then there is a memory access time. Memory access is read or write. So, I will call it as memory access time and it there is uh, and it reads. So, suppose this tau plus m is the total time required for reading a reading some one byte from the memory. So, tau is the latency. The same thing we have talked when RAM wants to talk to disk, it has to actually when I want to move uh, from memory mem RAM to disk, I have to wait for the bus and then now, also understand that the very few peripherals talk directly to the CPU. The way by which peripheral actually talks to the memory is through, uh, talks to the CPU is through memory, okay. Very few peripheral talks directly with the CPU. In the sense, can you tell me one peripheral which will directly has to talk to the CPU? And in what, which way does it talk? Keyboard, for example, right? It has to talk to the peripheral, right? Uh, sorry, keyboard has to talk to the CPU. Why? Control C, you press it has to stop, no? When a program goes on an infinite loop, you go and press Control C, it has to stop. So, keyboard talks to the CPU through what we call as the interrupt mechanism. So, that is why you have several other interrupts, right? And sometimes it is a non maskable interrupt. I can't stop that interrupt. So if I press Control C, irrespective of what is happening, even a you know great program is running, VVVIP program is running, it will go and stop. Okay, right? 
but many peripherals do will not da transfer data directly from disk to the from, from the peripheral to the CPU. It will write into the memory and then you take it from the memory. Right? And one minute. When when just a minute. When there is a data transfer between the peripheral and the RAM, the CPU need not be involved. Right? Why should the CPU just keep watching what is going on? It will say, yeah, do that and it can basically start doing some processing. Okay. Right? So this is called DMA, direct memory access. So there will be some something called a DMA controller in this bus. And when, when a peripheral, when, when the CPU wants some data, it will tell the disk, it will tell the disk controller, transfer this much amount of data and then it will start doing its own activity, some other activity. And then the disk controller will transfer the data to some location in the RAM, okay. And it will bypass the CPU, right. CPU will just say I need this data, disk controller and RAM will talk to each other and the, the data transfer will be done and similarly I want to write back to the disk I will tell the RAM I will tell the uh, again the DMA saying this amount of data from RAM has to go to this and then this as a CPU I do not get involved further and that transfer happens that is why we call it as disk direct memory access okay. We will understand more about it when we go into the IO part that is the last part of this course right but as of now this is we need to understand that if the CPU wants to access RAM, like how RAM when it wants to access the disk, right? it has to wait, it has to request the bus, it has to wait for some latency, tau time and then it, it gets control over the bus and then it goes and access and so the total time involved is not just access time but is some tau plus m time. And so that is, I will come back to your question later. The same argument, so suppose I want to read k bytes from the memory, for example x86 is a byte addressable memory, so suppose I want to read k bytes then it becomes k into tau plus m. I access one byte, give off the bus, again request for the bus then access next byte. Instead of doing that whenever I access one byte I do not just bring that byte alone, I bring a, a, a block of data, the word block is used here, block block was used even in the lane. One block was for me one page in the case of paging, here also I bring one block of data from the memory. So, so then what happens is let that block be k bytes, then the total time involved now will become tau plus k into m rather than k into k into tau plus m. So, this is now become tau plus k into m. So, my I I reduce, I, I actually inc improve the performance by several folds because my tau which is reasonably significantly large amount is not getting multiplied by k. And this type of a transfer is very good for me because it will be beneficial for me because of what? Huh? Locality of reference. So I have both spatial and temporal locality. So, because of locality of reference, this particular block transfer is going to be very, very beneficial. Now, so, <coughs> so what I do is instead of when I am accessing RAM, I do not, I just bring a block of data. I need one byte, but I do not bring just that byte, I bring a block of byte and that I need to store somewhere and that is, that is some storage which is on the chip, so this is why it is called on chip storage, okay. And that where, so I am bringing k bytes, no, where will I store it here? So I store it in something called the cache memory, okay. So the cache memory is a intermediate uh, memory which is very close to the CPU, very totally, very tightly coupled with the CPU in the heart of the CPU, right. So, and I can access instructions very, very fast and why, what is the role of the cache? It will store whatever is fetched from the RAM, it will store it in the cache and then, so the subsequent accesses I need not go to the RAM but I could keep accessing it from the cache. Are you able to get this? So, this is one 
very this is how cash memory has come into place okay we will now talk about cash in today's class and probably next week we will talk more about caches okay doubt sir you said in last semester that keyboard is also a memory mapped io yeah keyboard has been a uh, keyboard is also a memory mapped io in the sense that the data that comes from the keyboard essentially goes to a buffer in the memory and then you re keep reading it from that buffer then like you told yeah, but here is only the control signal goes directly to the cpu so i am not transferring data but i am transferring some control control c is not a data right it's not you are typing a there is a difference between you typing login name versus control yes. so, so that's it okay right and you did implement keyboard in your last semester using memory map type right so you got this now we will go into how cache memory is organized so the difference the difference between uh, virtual memory and cache memory is that in virtual memory i had an elaborate the purpose of the virtual memory was different and i had an elaborate page translation mechanism now i cannot have another cache translation mechanism here the purpose of the virtual memory purpose of uh, paging was to provide you that 4 gb virtual memory that was the main intent while we look at caching the purpose of caching is what to improve speed of performance right this is one purpose as we proceed when we go on to you know task switching etc the the purpose of cache i can give you different varieties colors of purpose of cache so somebody ask you what is purpose of cache you can say i am improving performance that's a that's a good answer but i'll give you excellent answers okay but as we proceed right without cache your operating system itself will go for a dud okay it will become useless you cannot even get performance in the operating system. just not just that i could access some memory fast but there are many many more ramifications of that we will we will look at it in great detail but a very simple answer which any any tom dick and harry can give for this is that by having a cache i'll improve performance okay and that answer is sure okay now how is a cache organized i can't have a major another page table sitting inside my uh, chip so it has to be very straight forward so let us say i have let me say that there are 0 to 63 locations so how many bits i need 6 bits i need okay suppose i say there are 64 locations in my main memory and i have say four locations in my cache right so how will i so what i can do first i assume i will not look at blocks no let me just just i am bringing one byte my block size is just one byte just for our initial understanding later we will increase it to several bytes so i need to have a mapping mechanism so what i do is this is 6 bits and this is 2 bits okay let me call this 6 bits as b4 b5 b4 b b3 b2 b1 b0 okay now if i get if i bring say a 6 bits i will store it in location specified by b1 b0 so if i bring 0 from the ram to the cache i will store it in 0 if i bring 1 i'll store it here 2 i'll store it here 3 i will store it then 4 i will store in the same location where 0 is 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 i'll do for 12 13 14 15 16 0 4 8 12 16 okay 20 24 and all will be stored in the fourth location in the zeroth location of the cache 
15913, if at all they are brought, they will be stored in this. Then, then 2, 6, 10, 14 will be stored in the second location and third location. So, what is the cache doing? It is actually partitioning your entire address space into 4. One partition has 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, stores these addresses. The other partition stores 1, 5, 9, 13, etc. Other partition stores 2, 6, 10, 14, etc. and 3, 7, 11. So, the entire address space of 0 to 63 is now partitioned into 4. So, each one of this I call it as a cache line. So, I have 4 lines here. In each line, these are the addresses that could be stored. So, what I do? I bring 0. Let me say this is D0, D1 to D63. I So, D0 essentially gets stored here. Okay. Now, I bring D1, then, then say I bring D6, D6 gets stored here. Let me say I am accessing data in this way. I get D11, I get stored. Now, I bring D4. Then what happens? D0 is erased and D4 is loaded there. Okay. Right? You are getting this. So, so the mapping now is very straightforward. What I should do? I take the 6 bits, I throw, I take the last 2 bits and in that location I go and store the 6 bits. This is the data. So, my mapping from RAM to this is just take the last two bits and in that location go and st store the data you have. Correct? Are you able to follow? So, this is this, this is a very direct mapping and yeah, instantly it is called, this is called a direct mapped cache. Right? Okay? Now, what happens here? When initially I was trying to bring, the, so what will happen? The CPU, when it wants some address, it will generate that address. CPU generates the address, right? Now, with this address, it will go to this cache okay. and see if that address, the data corresponding to that address or instruction corresponding to that address is already stored here. If it is stored here, then it will just access from the cache. Access means read or write. If it is not stored, then it will bring from the RAM and then access it. Right? So, what will the CPU store? Generates address. Generates the address. Then inputs address to the cache memory. If data found, if, if, if uh, address stored, address available in cache, that is a better word, then say fetch it, else get from Okay. So, this is what we need to implement. If address available in cache, fetch it, else get from that. Address available, if this, if this is true, then we call it as cache hit. If this is false, then we call it as cache miss. We call this as cache hit, another we call it as cache miss, it is not there. Okay. Now, let us quickly get around with 3 or 4 implementation issues in this. What is the number 1 implementation issue? Now, you have done paging. What is number 1 implementation issue? In, in this, generating an address is clean. I will input the address to the cache, that is also clean because now in this case, I will have to go and find out if address is available in the cache. If this address, 
the data corresponding data or instruction corresponding to this address is it stored in the cache if it is there i will fetch it from the cache otherwise i have to go to memory now which the location in the cache will i look at very easy i take the last two bits and go there and what is the problem in looking at that ah exactly now very simple thing right i don't know whether it is corresponding to 0 or 4 or 8 or 12 or 16 so what i store here is in this i am zooming up this location here what i store there is the actual data plus what we call as tag bits what is the tag bit the first four bits the most significant four bits namely b2 b3 b4 b5 i'll store it in. correct so when i store say when i store d0 i would have stored 0 0 0 0 while i'm storing d4 i will store 0 0 0 1 because d4 is 0 0 0 1 0 0 so, so when when i am generating address 0 and suppose this is stored i will come address 0 is what 0 0 0 0 0 0 right so i take these two zeros i come here and if the tag bit matches this if the first two four bits of what i have generated matches the tag bit then i know that this is 0 that is being stored here right are you able to follow very very simple right right suppose I generate 4, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. I go to 0, 0, this location. I find the tag bit as 0, 0, 0, 0, but the actual bit I need is 0, 0, 0, 1. Then there is a mismatch. Okay. So, the first thing is that I will use, so I, if my ad address is k bits, I will use some amount of bits to index into the location and the remaining bits I have to store it as a tag. In this case, I had 6 bit address, I used 2 bits to index into the location, the remaining 4 bits I stored it as tag. Okay. Next implementation. Can you tell me what is the next most important issue here? We will need, so, huh? we'll need a dirty bit. Dirty bit is next one, before that. Dirty bit is heaven, roof, present. Valid. Huh? valid bit, yeah, present bit. Right, so hey, take some clue from what you have learnt, right? This is what you should extrapolate. Any location, no, it will be zeros and ones. So any data can be valid, right? So I will have one valid bit here. If it is one, that means whatever I have stored here is since. Because when I start, nothing is there. Nothing is there means what? There will be some zeros and ones there. And everything will make sense. I do not have an insensible <laughs> binary combination. No. Every every value I store, every 0 and 1 pattern I store will make some sense. So, I have to, so first I should say that is it a correct valid value which is written by the CPU or fetched from the memory or not. So, I will always have a valid bit. So, everywhere when you start making these type of storage mechanism, the storage will have some random values to start with. And so there is something called a valid bit. And so if you look at some of our architectures, including Intel, there will be a specific <coughs> in, 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 uh, invalidate in INVLD, I think, invalidate cache. So you will go and invalidate the entire cache. Means what? You make all the valid bits 0 for all these four locations. The next thing, which I will finish off in another two minutes, that we have start, we will have again this dirty clean bit business. Why dirty bit is important? Because, see I access D0 to start with. Let us say I am marking it in some orange color. Okay. I started with D0. Now 4 is accessed. Should I write back D0 to RAM and get D4? Or I can just overwrite D4. If I write back D0 and get D4, overwritten, then it becomes two memory accesses, which is very, very costly for me. If D0 has not changed, that is the value stored in D0 here, value of D0 stored here and here are the same. After I fetch, I am not touching that value. Then I need not go and write it back. I can just replace D4. So I have a dirty bit which is set to 1 the moment I go and write something into that location. Okay. 
So who is maintaining this valid bit, dirty bit, all these mapping, everything is done automatically by the hardware. If you look at what you have done in paging, uh, hey, please finish the paging assignment, then you can enjoy it cash much more nice, right? Please take some time and finish off that assignment. It is just a jujube simple assignment, okay? Just do it off, right? The point here is that I have, uh, in paging, the entire translation mechanism, everything was done with great support from the operating system. Here, operating system will not even know about what is happening inside the cache. Everything is completely handled by the hardware and it has to be handled by the hardware because uh, on an instruction basis I need this service. So, it, I cannot have an operating system to service. So, I could have, I cannot have multiple instructions to service an instruction and that instruction which is servicing has to get serviced. Okay, So, there is a recursive problem here. So, this has to be handled completely by hardware. Okay. So, so now what we have stopped off today, I think by Monday we should keep all these things in mind. The structure of a location in a cache, we will have tag bits, you know why we need tag bits, we have the data which again you know why we need it, then we have a dirty bit and then we have a valid bit. Okay. With this we will stop, Monday we will take forward on caches. Okay. But by Monday I request all of you please spend some time and finish off your paging assignment then then it becomes easy for you to understand paging is very complex cache i assure you is much much less less complex and if you understand paging then this will be a cake work